Um, I'm just going to um, say that we, we, we have given you a full account of the distinguished public lives, careers, and achievements, and um, there's another word, I can't remember it, of uh, the, 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 the four speakers. Um, I'm therefore not going to repeat that now. I'm just going to introduce one by one, and I begin by um, introducing uh, Catalan Cox. Uh, Catalan, you and I have known each other for about 30 or 40 years. All that time, as with David Alton, you have been a, a prominent, active um, a, a campaigner for human rights in general, but particularly r rights of religious people in particular, and Christians. And um, uh, I, I have very much, along with others here, admired your work. And now, perhaps I can ask you to begin by begin by responding, but of course you're going to tell us from a practical standpoint how actually the West does behave in relation to these things and as you've seen it. Carol Cox. Well, John, thank you very much for the... Thank you, very much. thank you now, you may not want to later. But thank you very much, John, for inviting me to be part of this very, very important conference and to be with people for whom I have such respect, speakers and participants as well. It's a great privilege. Is the microphone on? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, if you can't and you still want to, do let me know. And I will be showing a PowerPoint, so if you can't see, there are some spare seats around here, because pictures speak louder than words, and I really want to focus on some of the pictures. As David Campanale said, pictures are so powerful. Why don't you all come in this way? We have a few seats here, if anyone wants to move. Well, as long as you can see. What if you can have a main light down? Is that possible? Yes. Because, yes. okay, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to begin very, very briefly by introducing myself, more modestly than uh, you have kindly done, John, because all I ever say about myself, if you've heard me speak, you know all I do say about myself, is I'm a nurse and a social scientist by intention and a baroness by astonishment. <laughs> I wasn't into politics, I was very much not into politics, I was the first baroness I'd ever met. <laughs> and it's quite a shock. You wake up one morning, you find a baroness looking at herself out of the bathroom mirror, and you think, well, you know, what a, an amazing situation, but what a great privilege. How do I use the privilege of being able to speak in the House of Lords? And the message came very clearly. It's a wonderful place to be a voice for those who don't have a voice, or people who have voices whose voices are not heard. So that's how I use my role in the House of Lords. And to help with that, I established a small NGO called Heart Humanitarian Aid Relief Trust, to work for people suffering oppression and persecution who are largely unreached by major aid organizations and often by media. By major aid organizations, either political reasons, they're not invited, we spend quite a lot of our time crossing borders unofficially and illegally sometimes and quite shamelessly, we have people who are off the radar screen of aid and whose voices are not heard by the media. So I wanted to use the opportunity this afternoon to bring together so many of the concerns which have been articulated so powerfully, but in a very <coughs> down-to-earth case study of Nigeria. It's been referred to by my noble friend David Alton, uh, by Mervyn Thomas, but it really is one of the situations in the world today which does highlight the sort of concerns that bring us together. I could have given equally um, down-to-earth and first-hand presentations relating to Syria. We're working in Syria. Or relating to Sudan, we're working in Sudan and also Burma, Eastern Burma. We hear about the Rohingya and their suffering is real. We do not hear about the predominantly Buddhist Shan and the predominantly Christian Kachin. I was in Shan State just last week. We don't hear about them. Heavy fighting going on, thousands of displaced off the radar screen of media. So I could have given case studies of any of those, but today, Nigeria. Now I'm going to sit down, A, because most people can see through me, but may not be able to see through me to the um, important PowerPoint. But also I want to get out of frame. I want you to travel with me and visit Nigeria. The first slide was amazing. I just walked into the courtyard of a pastor's home, a Christian pastor's home, which had recently been burnt. This hadn't been put together, uh, but there are the symbols of suffering and persecution, the cross and the nails. Hidden atrocities, the escalating persecution and displacement of Christians in northern and central Nigeria. My microphone is buzzing in my ears. Is it okay for you? It's okay, that's fine. Over recent decades, thousands of Christians have been killed and hundreds of churches have been burnt. And many Muslims have also died, especially at the hands of Boko Haram, those who do not go along with the Islamist ideology of Boko Haram. The escalation of Boko Haram's brazenness created, as we all have heard about, we have heard about this, a reign of terror and intimidation in northern Nigeria. Hundreds of churches burnt, thousands of Christians killed, abducted, kidnapped. 
uh, the Bishop of Bauchi, Anglican Bishop of Bauchi, in uh, one of his destroyed churches. I'm afraid I could show you hundreds of these pictures. One of Boko Haram's policies was to take their suicide bomb or their suicide motorbike and take it into uh, a church while a worship service was going on and detonate it during the service. So many people who came to service would not survive to the end of the service or were bereaved or injured. That happened in so many times. Uh, but they still worship in the ruins, to God be the glory, even in the ruins. But this has been referred to this morning, the very recent disturbing development of the Fulani herdsmen. The Fulani herdsmen, for time immemorial, used to roam through lands with their vast herds of cattle, but recently they've adopted a new policy of attacking Christian villages, destroying homes, driving people off their lands, and settling in their place. Real, serious, large-scale ethnic and religious cleansing, particularly in Central Belt. Now that Islamist insurgency continues in northern and central Nigeria to escalate as they, the Fulani herdsmen, use now sophisticated weaponry and barbaric practices to displace vulnerable rural communities. Thousands of Christians have been killed in recent years and hundreds of churches being burned. Now, the insurgency is not, as some, including the UK government, have claimed a mere tit-for-tat clash. That's what we've heard from the dispatch box in the House of Lords. A tit-for-tat clash between herders and farmers. Rather, Fulani militants are strategically grabbing land and permanently displacing Christian communities. I think um, David mentioned this this morning. Fulani herders have killed more people during 2015, 16, and 17 than Boko Haram. The Christian Association of Nigeria reported that Fulani militants last year killed several thousand Christians, several thousand Christians, between January and June. The killings continued. Just one or two examples. In an attack on the 22nd to 24th of June last year, at least 218 people were killed in Plateau State, in Barkin Mardi. The majority of the victims were women and children. At one location, 120 were killed as they returned from a funeral of an elderly member of the Church of Christ Nation. And a quote from the rector of one of the churches there, and these are his words. The Fulani killer herdsmen, FKH, are unspeakably barbaric and brutal beyond words. They're much crueler than Boko Haram, who strap bombs on kids and deploy them as suicide bombers. The FKH, the Fulani, makes sadistic butchering an art form. The disemboweling of pregnant women, the butchering of the fetus is a speciality of theirs. They intend to inspire the fullest possible terror by the horror of their atrocities. This explains why they mutilate corpses even after death. We visited four villages that had been attacked by and ruined by the Fulani. Um, in those four villages, most had fled. A few had tried to come back. Uh, here is one of the local pastors, but you see the ruins of their homes behind them. We also stood in the ruins of the pastor's home, the pastor where he'd been slaughtered in that very house. To stand in place of modern day martyrs is immensely humbling. In Jos, this Holy Trinity Church used to be the university church. I remember it when it was a fully standing church. It's now been attacked by the Fulani. It's now in ruins. The um, Anglican vicar, uh, well, Anglican canon, Hassan John, he, this is his church. After it had been attacked and destroyed like that, uh, he was given a large tent. It was meant to be a fireproof tent in which they could continue their worship in the ruins of the church. But just before we got there, the Fulani attacked that tent. They stole what they wanted to steal, the musical equipment and so on. And then all the stuff they didn't want to take with them, they piled on the place where the high altar was, and they burnt it. And they burnt it with such an intense fire that even that so-called fireproof tent uh, was ruined uh, by that in the place of the high altar. Um, killings were going on when we were there. Um, Archbishop um, ben Quashi, the Anglican Archbishop, whom we'll meet in just a moment, but he and his lovely wife Gloria have adopted about 60 kids as a kind of large adjacent orphanage in the home next to their home. They kept animals, it was lovely for kids to play with animals, and just before we got there, the Fulani went and killed all his animals and shot his um, animal keeper in the head and said, we'll be back with more killings. That was the ruin where the animals had been killed or taken. We met a lot of people who'd had to flee from the Fulani attacks. Now, you don't see the major aid organizations up there at all. I didn't see UNHCR. 
thousands are being looked after largely by local churches. This is one of the areas where some of the hundreds and hundreds of people who've had to flee those villages are trying to eke out a living with the help of churches in complete destitution. Uh, the sanitary facilities are horrific. Uh, you don't want to go near them for their smell, but it's all they have. And in this particular room, not a very large room, 1,000 children and 800 women sleep every night. Talking to some of the survivors of the Fulani attacks, here I'm talking to one of them. She didn't mind her picture being shown, but just one or two of the stories which illustrate uh, the atrocities which have been referred to earlier on. Uh, this is someone from the village of Trindung and Kura. We heard gunshots. 80 people were killed. Their bodies were set alight. They burned homes. An old man who couldn't run was killed. Another person, the church warden at St. Timothy Church in Dross itself. They came around 7 o'clock and left just before midnight. More than 200 of them in black cloth, well armed. Yesterday, we lost another 19 of our people. And this is the remains of that church, St. Timothy's Church in Dross, after the attack. Another heartbreak story. My sister was raped, her wrists cut off before she was shot through the heart. They took my brother, his wife, and all their six children, tied them, and slaughtered them like animals. Another. They shot Sarah's husband and children, so she begged them to kill her too. But they refused, saying they wanted her to cry and bear the pain. She came to church this week. And I know very well uh, the people in that congregation and to see all your family sorted and be left alive to bear the pain, just says a little bit about the sadism of the attacks. Helen, I called my brother, but there's no reply. Next morning, I found out that he, his wife, and four others were shot, butchered, and burnt. They were hacking and killing people, making sure that those that were shot were finished off. They wore red to conceal blood splashes on their clothes as they butchered people with machetes. I could give you many more case studies like that. Just one or two photographs, and as David said, photographs are important. Either the photographs I've taken myself or I know the person who has taken them. A nasty photograph of survivors being taken away from a village that's been attacked by the Fulani. And a mass grave. As I draw to a conclusion, there is an urgent need to call the government of Nigeria to account to fulfill its obligation to protect all its citizens, regardless of religion, and to provide humanitarian aid for the millions of displaced people. And very briefly, just one or two points to make, I and colleagues such as David Alton in the House of Lords have spoken on numerous occasions about the severity of the Fulani insurgency. We have urged the Foreign Office to make representation of the government of Nigeria, to take effective action to protect all their citizens, and to call to account those who have been perpetrating atrocities. We urge the Foreign Office to work with the High Commission in Abuja to ensure that adequate humanitarian aid is available for those suffering the loss of family members, the destruction of their homes and crops, and who have been forced to become internally displaced people. And we ask the government to urge the Nigerian government to undertake an investigation into ethnic and religious persecution of the affected people and the operation of the Nigerian army during these attacks. But as I mentioned earlier, the Foreign Office refers to Fulani attacks <coughs> against Christians as ethnic riots, a consequence of population growth, land and water disputes, or tit-for-tat clashes between farmers and herders. While the causes of violence are complex, we recognize that, we suggest the Foreign Office must revisit the narrative and acknowledge the asymmetry and the escalation of attacks by well-armed Fulani upon predominantly Christian communities. Concerns about the misinformation are felt very strongly among the local population in the places we visit. Reverend Hassan John, an Anglican canon from Joss, the one whose church was destroyed and whose tent was burnt, he said, there have been arguments that the attacks are due to desertification and poverty, which is a claim many Nigerians in this region find very ridiculous. How much poverty leads people to massacre thousands of people in the villages at night, consistently for over a decade? Another local resident told me, it's annoying when politicians say this is a clash between herdsmen and farmers. I ask, how does a woman farming in her own farm clash with Fulani's carrying AK-47s? I suggest in view of the escalating persecution and displacement of Christians in northern and central Nigeria, it's insufficient merely 
the government does to urge all sides to seek dialogue and avoid violence. As I draw to a conclusion, uh, I mentioned earlier on Archbishop Ben Quashie, the Anglican Archbishop of Dross, his wonderful wife Gloria. They'd been attacked, they had to run out of their house, which was set alight, but carrying children on their shoulders. Gloria's been attacked and gang raped and had horrendous times. But they are still there, they still smile, the wonderful African Nigerian smiles. But the Archbishop gave us a bit of a challenge. He said, if we have a faith worth living for, it's a faith worth dying for. Don't you compromise the faith that we are living and dying for. And as I conclude, I just suggest two ways in which we are compromising that faith. One is, we of course all mourn the death of the Muslims in Christchurch. It was a horrendous situation and right to mourn it. But at the same time, even more Christians were killed in Kaduna. Did that hit the headlines? Did we have a minute silence in Parliament for them? We had a minute silence for the Muslims who were killed in Christchurch. They increased a large number of deaths of Christians in Kaduna went unmarked, unnoticed, and uncared about, apparently. And finally, um, what I, I, that I call double standards, the final thing is for me, personally, the double twist of the knife. We're out there, we see the suffering, we can see the anguish. There was a wonderful phrase by a Chaldean Catholic priest in Aleppo when we were there, and he referred to St. Thomas the Apostle, who put his hands into Christ's wounded hands and side. And this Chaldean Catholic priest said to us in Aleppo, when Eastern Aleppo was still in the hands of the jihadists and the bombs were coming in all the time, he said, thank you, and this is such a powerful image, thank you, like St. Thomas, you came to put your hands into the wounds of our suffering. It's what we try to do in heart. We can't feel the pain, the anguish that they've gone through, but we can try to put our hands into the wounds of their suffering. And then, as Christ said to Thomas, now you believe, go and tell. So we do put our hands in the wounds of their suffering, we do believe, we do go, we do tell. But the heartbreak is when we come and tell the British government, we get the kind of responses that have been the theme today, and it's the double twist of the knife. We have a silence or an inaction, and silence is complicity, and that is the double twist of the knife and the challenge which we all face. So thank you for letting me share a little bit of the pain and the passion today. Caroline, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, I th you're going to be around for questions, I think, aren't you? Um, good. I'm going to turn now to uh, next. The speaker is to Kishore Jha Balam. Um, Kishore is the um, representative to the Vatican of the Acton uh, Institute in the United States, uh, an institute which uh, has as its object, really, I think, to attempt to reconcile the uh, different concepts of, uh, of Catholic Christianity on the one hand, and secondly, of uh, of uh, the liberal principles of Lord Acton, uh, classical liberal principles. So. Um, th th that's a tradition of which you're well aware played a very heroic role in the uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries in defense of uh, Christians of, uh, abroad and of other people who were suffering persecution. It it seems in the main to to be less active today, but um, maybe you'll discuss that. Yes, uh, thank you, John. Um, it's a great privilege and honor to be here with so many people who have done so much on behalf of uh, persecuted believers. Um, I'm going to speak much more from the perspective of uh, my experience working for the, the Holy See, the Vatican, and especially its diplomatic efforts, because I spent um, two years working for the Holy See mission to the UN in New York, and then five years uh, working for the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, which whenever I told somebody that I worked for Justice and Peace, I was usually told I'm doing a terrible job because as we can tell, there's not, not a lot of justice or not a lot of peace in the world today. But at the same time, when, when you work for the Holy See, it's a quite unique experience. Um, the Holy See, as I'm sure most of you know, is an international state actor. Um, it's a government. It's a government unlike any other, however. It has a very small population, the, the, the few people who live in Vatican City State, but of course, it is the government of the Roman Catholic Church, and therefore has a universal, uh, I don't want to say concerns, I would say, it doesn't have a universal population, but it has universal concerns. 
And one of the vagaries, as we heard from the keynote this afternoon, one of the vagaries of uh, Western style or European liberalism is that religious freedom as a principle very much grew out of uh, Christian sectarian conflict, right? especially on this spectered isle. Uh, the writings of people like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke uh, very much affected the way I think Europeans and to a large degree North Americans and as far as we're all moderns, moderns um, think about the worst of evils is, is violent death, right? Especially when it's driven by religious conflict. And so the idea was to separate church and state. Of course, there were grounds to do so within Christianity, but really to do so formally as well. But also to make religion a, a private affair. Right? to make freedom of conscience uh, the primary value, uh, to make it something that ought to be protected uh, virtually absolutely. You know, there, of course, so if you read some of the early moderns, there were always qualifications being made because there were still largely Christian societies of a Catholic or Protestant or Orthodox variety, which meant that any minority religion was going to feel a little bit threatened and out of place. So out of concern for the common good, I would say that uh, the Catholic Church, to a large degree, accepted a lot of the principles of liberalism. Now, what my institute tries to do is reconcile economic liberty with uh, Christian teaching. But economic liberty, as I, I think earlier this morning, Lord Alton mentioned uh, Brian Grimm, who tries to promote the idea that liberalism goes together with different forms of liberalism, political liberties, civil liberties, economic liberties, religious liberties, are indivisible that somehow they're part of uh, our human nature. This became very much the Vatican's diplomatic stance, I would say, over, you know, it, it took a long time, but it developed to the point where I would, I would say that, in a way, the Catholic Church is the last defender of liberalism. Uh, there are very few liberals out there who want to defend, as, we, as we're seeing, fundamental human rights. But if you look at what Popes from, uh, I would say certainly from P Paul VI, all the way until the current pontiff, they've done a lot to try to defend this notion of fundamental human rights. Even to the point where last week, I, I, I've just, I was in Rome last week, uh, I have the text here of the Cardinal Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Perlin, spoke at a, uh, a symposium on international religious freedom at the US Embassy to the Holy See, in which he outlined the problems affecting international religious freedom. And it really is quite a liberal statement he is making about defending uh, minorities, about uh, peaceful coexistence, uh, about all the kind of things that you would have thought if you rewind, let's say, 500 years ago or something, that these are the things that the Catholic Church was very much accused of. And a few speakers have already told us that that might influence the way we look at defending Christianity. And so if we look at the human rights regime, if we look at liberalism as a type of secular Christianity, right, a way of treating people on a Christian basis without making theological claims, I think that pretty much describes the way we look at uh, the state of, of Vatican diplomacy today. It doesn't try to uh, make special pleadings for Christians, even though the Holy See is supposed to represent the Catholic Church, it does all it, all it can to avoid right, saying that we speak for Christians or we speak for Catholics and we are therefore going to defend our people against religious threats, against secular threats, ideological threats, whatever it may be. Now, diplomats being diplomats, their words and their deeds don't always match. So they will say things in principle about um, defending all religious minorities, and I, I do believe that they, the Vatican diplomats believe this. But at the same time, when they try to act on behalf of Catholics right, in foreign lands that are persecuted, when they try to act on behalf even of other religious minorities by asking for uh, refugees and asylum seekers to be let in and given safe haven, safe protection, right? They do so in ways that are very much of a different era. The diplomats don't like to uh, publicize what they're doing. They don't like to make uh, uh, a big show of their agreements, especially with hostile governments. Uh, Damien Thompson mentioned 
the, the Vatican Accords with China. Uh, I think it's a perfect example of this, where the Holy See does not have diplomatic relations, of course, with Beijing. But it's making this deal, which the Chinese looks like they're taking advantage of to a great degree. And the Holy See, at, at this very conference I'm referring to last week, Cardinal Paroline said, we have to be patient. Right? We have to let the process pay out, play out and let, let time affect, because the unity of the church for the Holy See is very important. Now, t try telling that to the people whose churches are being bulldozed or to people who are being thrown into jail or being forced to join the patriotic church. Um, Patience is not a commodity that, that, that they find very much in, uh, in, high qual in high quantities in their countries. So what, what should the Holy See be doing instead? Right? Um, does it need to be making uh, more of a case for Christians and for Catholics? I think perhaps we're at the point where if nobody else is going to respect the principles of liberalism, right? if nobody else, if, if Europe is not going to defend liberalism, if... Uh, you're dealing with a religious conflict on one side only, for example. Um, it's getting harder and harder to maintain this uh, defense of liberalism when nobody else is willing to do so. And I think this poses a real challenge for, for the Holy See and for the diplomats. Um, as I said, it's a very strange situation where the greatest opponent of liberalism is now defending liberalism. I mean, this is a, a very strange state of affairs from a historical or philosophic perspective. I think there's another problem from the Holy See's perspective in that what do they expect the modern liberal state to do? Um, in many ways, the, the Holy See has promoted a, a type of soft humanitarian or welfare state, right? a state that provides social services, um, that is able to treat people uh, with as it you know in regard to their enable human dignity right by providing things like social services and food and housing unemployment but at the same time that distracts states from being able to do things that they normally ought to do like protect people's lives protect property protect religious liberty as the state moves from a liberal to a more post-liberal humanitarian type of perspective it forgets its fundamental roles and what it's supposed to do. And I think you're seeing that weakness manifested in the lack of concrete uh, proposals as to what Western governments can actually do to fight the persecution of Christians, especially um, in faraway places. This idea of the non-interference or non-judgmentalism of multiculturalism creates a real problem for Western states. Um, when dealing with China, the Chinese make a point of emphasizing the non-interference in the affairs of sovereign states all the time. Right? This is the only way you can do business with China, if you don't interfere in their internal affairs. So again, it makes it very difficult for diplomats to be able to say, we will do business with you if you respect the rights of your religious minorities. The Chinese say that's none of your business. Right? And again, this makes it very difficult for uh, Western governments who are lacking already the confidence in their own liberal principles to insist on them with others. And um, as I said, the Holy See is, is the last of the liberals in, the, in this regard. It's, it's a very strange situation. Though, by the way, th that is not, those aren't my words. Those are words that Alan Bloom once used um, for, uh, in an obituary for Raymond Aron who, as a French political writer, he was the last of the liberals against all the communists and progressives and things. And again, I think now we can, we can apply it to the Catholic Church. Um, one final point I would like to make about why we have some vagaries within Vatican diplomacy. One is that they adopt the, as I mentioned, the kind of post-liberal European consensus. Most of the Vatican diplomats are Europeans. They're obviously trained in Europe, in Rome. And so they adopt almost by default the European secular humanist outlook on things, even though as priests, there's a side of them that knows that it's not, that's not the truth, that's not the final answer. So they're caught between these two worlds. And again, it makes it very difficult for diplomats to address this problem head on. But I think a more serious religious or theological problem, and this might sound perverse, but I think Baroness Cox's last slide, which is still up on the screen, indicates the problem. 
Um, we are told by Jesus Christ himself that we're blessed if we're persecuted, that we will be persecuted if we follow him. Right? We'll be persecuted in his name. So to some degree, if we're not being persecuted, we're not doing something right. right? That somehow we're not being faithful enough. So I think there's, again, it, it's perverse sounding. Forgive me for saying this, because when, when other people are suffering for it, I, sound, I, sound, I, I feel stupid for saying this, right? Because other people are paying the price. But to some degree, to be persecuted and to be a martyr, right, is one of the greatest glories a Christian can have. And if you, if you ask the, the people who are being persecuted, if they are truly faithful, right, they pray for their persecutors. They offer their pain and suffering for the greater glory of God. This makes it very difficult, again, for Christians to think that, okay, we want religious freedom, we want people to be safe, that's a good thing. But if it comes at the price of watering down the faith, if it comes at the price of going along with secular humanism, if it goes along at the price of becoming a type of European style society, there's a real question whether it's worth it. And there's a real tension there that I'm not sure the Vatican diplomats have thought about, but I know the popes have. And uh, there's this, again, this type of schizophrenic attitude that says on one hand, we want people to respect human rights. We want people to live in freedom, peace, and security. But at the same time, we know that to the degree as we live a Christian life, that we're going to be asking for uh, more crosses for all of us. So again, this is kind of the, the view from Rome, if you want to put it that way. It's, not, uh, it, it's never made explicit. One of the good things about being a former Vatican employee is that I can speak freely about such things. Uh, Vatican diplomats uh, generally do not speak freely, um, partly because they're diplomats, partly because they're priests, and they're, because they're trained to do so. And this creates all kinds of problems that um, I'm not sure the diplomats have thought about solving. But again, I think it also indicates why Western governments have a very hard time of thinking of deeds to go along with their words when they speak about this issue. So I'll leave it there. I'm going to invite Miriam to speak in a moment. Um, after Miriam, I think that we'll throw the, um, qu the uh, questions open to the floor. Uh, then at the final stage, I'll turn to David and ask him to respond to some of the uh, points raised, and then all of you will, each of you will get a chance to reply. So, Miriam, um, I know you because in European politics, you've been a strong defender of, of um, Christian democracy with, uh, with um, emphasis on the Christian as well as the de democracy, something which is not altogether common these days. You're standing for the European Parliament. You've been very active in um, both um, uh, European politics in general, but also in relations with the United States, uh, encouraging uh, believers on both sides of the Atlantic to help each other. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for the invitation. And I feel very honored to be able to say a couple of words here, especially because I come from Central Europe, from ex-communist country. I think it's, it's, a, it's a different perspective I will try to provide. When I was asked to, to give some remarks after Professor David Martin Jones, and, and we have received his, uh, his remarks in, uh, in advance, I, I was thinking about the moment when my father told me in the early 90s, like, be careful with the Western academics because they're all Marxist. They look like, they look like they're liberal, but they're all Marxist because the Soviets have actually focused on the academia, on the young people in general, in the 60th generation, and on the academia. When I started to travel around into the West, and as John said, that I was working, I am working with uh, with the United States, with the International Republican Institute. I thought, like, but they all say they are liberal, so they sh it should be okay. I mean, of course, they're not Christian; they're kind of atheistic, but but they they respect freedom, they like freedom. But getting a little bit deeper and deeper in the issue, I actually realized that the current liberals are actually mar Marxist. And I started to think, like, but what is the thing which is actually making Marxism and 
today, and I don't like to use the word because I think it's a, it's a perverse way of using the word liberalism, but what is the people who say they are liberal today and the, the former Marxist, uh, Marxist ideology, what do they have in common? And I think the point which they have in common is that instead of making people equal, which is the kind of outspoken desire, they're trying to make people the same. The uniformity, the desire for some kind of uniformity is actually what makes the current people who call themselves liberals and the former Marxists uh, the same. They have the same approach. Because to, to respect the, the God's creatures, our differences between men and women, rich and less rich and poor, uh, talented and less talented, to make these or to understand these people as equal, I think we have to respect the divine plan of humanity. And because both of the ideologies re disregard God, then they shift or tweak the kind of the, the equal desire or desire for equality into this uniformity. Maybe the kind of, um, and, and now in the details, I mean the uniformity during the communist times was that everybody has to have the same. So everybody has to have a job, everybody has to have similar income, everybody has to have a house. It, it was kind of all ordered. But the kind of new version of this uniformity is going deeper into the personal level, that there are differences between men and women, but we are trying to make men and women the same. The differences between, between people who want to get married and people who cannot get married or do not want to get married. And we are trying to force the people into the sameness or uniformity. So the, the kind of de desire for uniformity has come much closer to our, I would say, soul and our, our personality as a, as a result of God's creature. Then the second aspect I would like to focus on is uh, uh, the dichotomy Eric Fromm has written about to be and to have. Because I think that this dichotomy is also playing a very important role in today's world and kind of the, the emphasis on to have is making us less able to fulfill our role as Christian Western world towards the others, but also towards ourselves. And here I would say maybe it's the, again, I mean, to have before during the communist times, it was to have a property. There was a very poor working class and the Marxists came with a plan how to provide for them, how to give them bread and butter, how to make them survive, but it had enormous costs. And today we are also trying to kind of provide for the desire to have, but it's again kind of like a closer to the people. We, we make people artificially to decide what they want and what they don't want. We have a gay man who, when he decides to have a child, we are trying to provide a child to everyone who has the desire. If a mother who conceived the child doesn't want to have a child, we believe that she has a right to say no because this is the, 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 the desire of her to have or not to have is a prior to any, anything else. And, and this, is, this is where we are failing to bring the being into our society in the focus on to have, which is a kind of hidden focus on, on to have. But in terms of our relationship to the third world, I think it's also what we see and the prosecution of many Christians, but also prosecution of people for their belief, even ideological <coughs> beliefs, is often a result of the, of the former to have, like the, the financial to have, because in the global world, we often act uh, in such a way towards the third countries that we are trying to uh, use the global world into our economic advantages. And this leads into the fact that we are often helping totalitarian regimes or regimes which are prosecuted, not only believers or people because of the faith, but because of whatever people believe or whatever they want to do or because of their desire to be free. And here I would emphasize our role that, uh, that often we are not, not being aware that how the economic uh, 
progress we have had in the last 50, 60 years is thanks to the exploitation of many countries around us where we now see people being prosecuted, but we, I believe that we are somehow part of, the, uh, part of the reason why this is happening in the third world. And the third point I would like to mention is relativism. And here I would use a, a quote, which I have in my phone, if you give me a second, of Malcolm Muggeridge, the your country fellow, who once said, one of the peculiar sins of the 20th century we have developed to a high level is the sin of credulity. It has been said that when human beings stop believing in God, they believe in nothing. The truth is much worse. They believe in anything. And, and I think this is an absolutely correct quote of what is happening today. And maybe you have heard of, uh, of the... Of the uh, title or, or how Benedict the Sixteenth, the emeritus uh, pope, he he has been not talking about relativism, relativism as such, but he has been going a bit further and he has talked about the totality of relativism, that this is a new form of totality which is oppressing us, because we believe that that everything goes along. We can disregard God, disregard Christianity, but still pretend that we are protecting prosecuted Christians in the third world. We can, uh, we can disregard uh, people who are disabled or because we don't let them even to be born, but we can still believe that our country or our society is based on equal rights or respect to everyone. There are many countries where they have actually uh, the protection of life from conception in the, in, the, in the constitutions, but they allow abortion. So this relativism the people are born into and we are living in are actually making us absolutely ignorant to the, to the intolerance of others because we are ourselves intolerant to many groups or many people in our own society. So I just wanted to mention these three points because I think when we are trying to come to some kind of solution, I think we have to address each of them. And maybe the final point is because obviously I think that it's, if we talk only about the how, how despair the society is or the, our situation is, we will never come to solutions. But when I think of a solution, I'm thinking maybe and coming back to, to the conclusions Baroness Cox has at the, at the last uh, slide, is that we have to start from ourselves. We have to continue doing what we do and our best. We should not give up. But on the other hand, we have to come back to our faith because the only, I mean, we are sent to this world to help to, or to be saved and to live in such a way that we can be saved and to help the others be saved. So it all starts with faith. If we are going to help prosecuted Christians, but our faith will be failing, I think we will t uh, turn it the other way around it should be. Because if we will come back to our faith, if we will live our faith, the world will be changing around us and God will allow that and help us to, to do our, our deeds and help the others. Thank you very much. Miriam, thank you very much. Now, let me take questions. I'd, I'd like... No more than 10 minutes. No, no. There's a question right at the back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alp Mehmet from Migration Watch. Um, I'd like to refer back to David Jones's, uh, Professor Jones's um, brilliant lecture, frankly, as, as good an account and as clear an account of um, how we've arrived where we are and why we have got here. I'd like to ask about the future, the clash between two civilizations, if you like. Um, at a time when uh, Anglicanism no longer features in the way we... It no longer drives this country's way of life. At a time when the number of churches are dwindling, uh, congregations are decreasing. Um, but at the same time, if you're looking at Islam, the number of mosques 
44 years ago, 45 years ago, there were two in this country. There are now some 2,000. The congregations, if I can call them that, in mosques are burgeoning. And those who attend mosque find that their way of life is actually a guided, dominated by their religion. What will the future hold for this country? Um, how will that clash manifest itself? Um, perhaps, forgive me for, for a lengthy question, but I thought it important to put it into the right context. Th thank you very much. But and because we are uh, operating under a tight schedule, let me take two, or th two more questions and then throw them open to the, to the floor. Gentleman there, and the gentleman over. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, it's, uh, it's just a quick reflection, if I may. It's not a question. It's about uh, the, the, the issue of, the, of media indifference towards uh, the persecution of Christians. Uh, I was born in Damascus. I grew up in the Middle East. I came to this country a uh, long time ago, 20 years ago, maybe. Uh, one of the things that shocked me uh, the most when I came over uh, was media indifference towards the persecution of Christians and how Christians are treated uh, in different parts of the world. And I asked this question so many times, uh, this question so many times. And I think my reflection is that there is a deep sense of guilt in the Western subconscious. And this comes uh, from the association between Christianity, associating Christianity with colonialism, slave trade maybe, and uh, <coughs> uh, crusades as well. Uh, and of course, uh, Western media is dominated by leftist and liberal circles, and the narratives of tho those circles feed into uh, this sense of guilt, because they tend to associate Christianity with 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 uh, with all those bad things. So no wonder why Western media is indifferent towards uh, the, the persecution of Christians. Good. Thank you. My name is John Bosco, and I'm originally from Pakistan, uh, a country uh, where Christians are being persecuted from the last 71 years. So the horrible pictures which Baroness Cox has shown, the Christians of Nigeria. So my question is uh, to you, what our government is doing to stop the persecution? It's a horrible. I do uh, persecution programs for the, for the, for the, for the, from the last nine or 10 years. And um, I'm a freelance journalist and especially raises the voice for the persecuted Christian. So my question is, what our government is doing and what the other governments are doing to stop this, um, the, the killings of the innocent Christians in Nigeria? Thank you very much. Um, um, what I'm going to do, if uh, we're still under uh, tight pressure, uh, well, um, I'm going to ask um, um, Darren's Cox to start. Replying will go from uh, right to left across the platform. So. Well, if I can just very briefly um, refer, first of all, to the question about the future. One of the concerns which worries me very much is that we are at the moment really stifled in speaking about some of our main worries for fear of being called Islamophobic. And I'm very worried about the whole Islamophobia issue and definition and so on, because there are genuine concerns. For example, differential birth rates and polygamy uh, in the country which doesn't allow bigamy, we allow polygamy. And Henry Jackson Society did a study some time ago, and they looked at the differential birth rates of all the different groups who've come to live in our country, and virtually all come back to the British birth rate. Uh, but the Islamic birth rate, uh, I think, check me, I, I wouldn't swear to be accurate on this, I think it was seven to nine times percent higher than the British birth rate. So there's a real concern that demography may be on the way to changing democracy. And in an attempt to try and address that, I do have a private member's bill in Parliament which would require all religious marriages to be legally registered, 
which would then actually stop the abuse of women and the, use, um, and the use of polygamy, which caused a lot of suffering to Muslim women. But we've got to talk about these things. And there is a real fear that if anyone does talk about it, you'll get called Islamophobic and you'll be in trouble. Well, I'm sorry, we've got to tell the truth and we've got to speak out for the sake of our spiritual, cultural and political heritage. And so that's what I'm trying to do in Parliament. And that's the purpose of my private members bill, to raise awareness. But it's a, a small step uh, to try to stop a very serious development. Um, very, very briefly, as far as what the British government's doing uh, in, in response to Nigeria, I would say the same response to Sudan. The situation in Sudan is dire. It was there just early this year. It crossed over into Blue Nile State. But at the moment, you may or may not have seen on the news, there's been very inadequate coverage. There's massive protests that have been going on against the al-Bashir regime, which is took power by illegal coup. It's an Islamist regime in 1989, being responsible for three million dead, five million displaced, masses of thousands taken into slavery, brutal regime. Uh, the Sudanese people have been rising up in protest, had very, very, very little media coverage. But I've raised this in Parliament, as I've raised the Nigerian issue in Parliament, and the answer we always get is, well, the British government is talking to the government of Sudan. My reply to that has been, for all the years I've been going to Sudan, during that regime's uh, perpetration of atrocities, is, well, the regime in Khartoum loves talking to the British government, but continues to kill while it talks. And it's the same in Nigeria. So we're not doing enough. Basically, we're talking, and talking is just a form of complicity, in my view. Thank you. Uh, maybe to say one, uh, one word. The A2, A2 Church in Need organization, I work with them quite often, and, and they told me that in the Middle East there is a huge um, kind of way of conversion of, of people from Islam to Christianity because they see how much the Christians are able to to kind of fight for their own right to faith and, and, and physical protection. When Christian camps, I mean, where they are refugee camps, when they allow, for example, Islam or, or Muslim women to join the camp under the death threat. Because, so, so the Christians, are, when we are living our faith, I think we are able to address the Muslim people. And I know a couple of people who, who converted from from Islam to Christianity. And I, I would again appeal on this. I mean, yes, the numbers are against us. The um, uh, numbers of whatever, the, the, the development as we see is against us. But I think we still have the, the finger on the pulse of the day in, in our heart when we open it to God. Thank you. The only, only thing I have to add, I would love to be able to convert Muslims to, to Christianity. I'm a convert myself, so it can be done, not from Islam, but from, from kind of a secular Hinduism. I, I became Catholic. But I also think we need to encourage Muslims who agree with religious freedom. Um, there has to be a way. We have an act in a, a fellow named Mustafa Akiol, who um, works for the Cato Institute, which is not always the most religious friendly, friendly place. But he's written books about the Islamic Jesus. He's written about... Uh, liberalizing Islam, ways to, from, from within Islam, because it's much easier to do it from within than from without, change the, the understanding of Islam. Um, I know that in, in Budapest, when I was with John and Melissa, there was a panel about how the Catholic Church has developed over time in its doctrines, um, when it comes to religious freedom, when it comes to slavery, when it comes to usury. These things take a long time. It might be easier within Christianity and Catholicism to develop the doctrine in such a way, but trying to encourage both secularists and, and uh, Islamicists, the political forms of Islam, to develop in that, in that way, I think might be, uh, might be a way forward as well. Yes, I think obviously the conference is about persecuted believers, not solely Christians, and as we've recognized, we tried to recognize, I think, before, that the, um, the Muslim Uyghurs, uh, uh, my pronunciation of that is probably is, um, in China, is actually one of the single most uh, shocking and, and aggressive persecutions in the world today. And of course, um, there may be, if there's anyone in the audience who wants to discuss this later, I'd be happy to hear from them. But anyway, um, let me now turn to David for final summing up. So I've got, I've got to sum up everything. 
Well, <laughs> this session. Oh, this session. Okay. Um, uh, well, I thought it was a great session. Um, and regarding the future, um, obviously I don't have a crystal ball, um, but I think, as Miriam said, we do seem to be suffering from an acute state of relativism, uh, which is you know, pernicious, and leading to this kind of self-loathing that undermines any capacity, really, for um, uh, what we used to be concerned about in terms of a politics was within a state where different interest, interest groups could articulate their viewpoints. This was the notion of politics as an activity which was taught in universities when I was an undergraduate. We seem to have abandoned that, and we've abandoned the capacity to take particularly in universities, positions that are critical of ruling orthodoxies. And the consequences of this are an evolving, you know, elite mass divide. And one of the obvious consequences is of the rise of populism of the right, as well as the Islamism of Mus Muslim communities, which the government seems to do very little about, really. That's where I... Well, um, it seems to me that every conference should have, uh, among its conclusions, the demand for another conference to <laughs> clear up some of the questions that were left unanswered. And that seems to be um, uh, where this session has ended. They're brilliant, though, I think all of the speakers were, and I want to thank all of them on your behalf. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, and. Uh, There will now be a, a few minutes break and we'll start again for the final session. Coffee, Coffee break, yeah, oh good.